we broke the budget of CERN. We were the first ones who told them that a calculation can be as expensive as one of the experiments. <laughs> Until then, they thought theories do nothing. You know, they, they added files or something, and suddenly we wiped out their budget of coffee. It was not part of it because I was uh, working with a professor who came from Japan, and it was tea. No coffee involved. I usually started working about eight or nine o'clock, and then I would get into my girlfriend's bed at something like 7 a.m. because uh, in the night shift, I actually had, you know, machines to myself. So I could start during the day. I had to compete with other people. So today is going to be another disaster because last time I felt I'm not giving you good enough presentation of a beautiful thing. This time I have to explain something which I think is useless. But all the community uses it, so you have to know it because, you know, if you talk to, let's say, Professor Fenton, he'll ask you to do this. So who am I to complain? But So that is something that was got a name, uh, fractals. It's much older than when it got named in in the popular press by a man called Mandelbrot who had a very developed sense of self. It starts very honorably. It starts in 19th century with Georg Cantor pondering what's the meaning of infinity. And this is very beautiful, but this is not what we want to cover here. I call them schmachtals because I'm just not a fan. Cantor had to explain what happens when you have very many, very small pieces. You know, how do you handle such situations? For that, he developed, as a simplest example, he developed very illustrative argument which turns out to be pretty close to what we do in dynamical systems. So in dynamical systems, we kind of had to relearn that stuff. But it wasn't done for that purpose. It was done for very abstract purpose. Uh, you might know that Cantor has different uh, cardinalities for infinities, and it's a beautiful math. But here is the idea. You start an interval whose size is one. You divide it into three pieces, equal size, and you throw away the middle one. You take each one of those pieces, divide it in three equal length parts, and you throw the middle one away. And that's an algorithm. I take something, I do an operation on it, and I get few things left. So now if I just look at this part, you know, that looks like the beginning of it. It just rescaled by factor of three. And if I look at this part, up to the scale, it's the same thing. So it's a self-similar structure saying that any sub-branch of it looks like the big thing rescaled. But the main thing for us is that this is defined by an algorithm which I can explain in, you know, 37 seconds because it's a simple and you just repeat this. You iterate it, just like we iterated maps when we were studying period W. So what can be said about this procedure? Cantor was interested what happens when you go to infinity. And you can see is that you have more and more holes and intervals are getting shorter and shorter. If you do this, you get something that visually looks like sprinkling of points. You know, by the time you reach the resolution of my children, uh, you know, uh, playground pens or a fancy printer or, you know, computer that you, at some point you won't be able to do, continue resolving. So for me, the most important thing is about this. This is defined by a simple deterministic law. That's most important thing that says, I have not Newton's equations, but it has something even simpler. 
and I just uh, apply it. Now, the result is arbitrarily small, kind of sprinkling that you, your printer dies at. It has this property which is not so general, but when you have it, you're very lucky, which is called it self-similar. And what it means is that the set, every subset of it, the rule applied to it produces the same structure, the same set. This happens sometimes when it happens, you're lucky, but not over. And now comes the thing that's highly non-obvious to me. The result of this has a dimension. By dimension, I mean the length and the width of the table and its height. These are three dimensions in the space, uh, which are number three. But this results in something that was very puzzling in 19th century. It's a non-integer dimension. This dimension is very easy to explain on counter set. So it has this seductive qual quality that because you understand it, you immediately want to apply it to everything. It's like bad music. It's seductive, you know, you hum it, but it's totally useless. The first thing that mathematicians thought about the set is that they should try to find out, you know, how big the set is. Now, we have a notion that you have learned in your calculus course, which is called Lebesgue uh, measure. You know, how you measure parts of the intervals on which you're estimating the integral of your function. Is there a Lebesgue measure for this set that says, for example, can I measure the length of this set? So when I get started, the set has length one. In the next step, it has intervals of size e to the three, but there are two of them. The next step, it has intervals which you have taken third over third, so this is three square, but there are four of them. And you see where this is going. The number of intervals is two to the power Uh, their size is 1 over 3 to the power. And it, we are so lucky, it's the same power. So that is the sum, the integral of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, you look at it, it says, well, that's not very useful because this clearly three is larger than two, I raised a number smaller than one to the power. But I look at the result and actually if you make holes smaller, it, it's strike, more striking. You know, if you make the hole one, uh, you know, sixteenth of the length and the rest is very fat. You have many, many what look like points, but from your algorithm, you know they're not points, they're intervals which are shrinking. How do you think about this? Now, before I go in more depth, I just want to explain that it's a dynamical system that we already know. Reviewing that is kind of useful. So as a dynamical system, it's something that we already did that we call Bernoulli map. I did it in a lecture where I told you you should forget everything about time evolution and look at lattices that you're free to ignore at this course, but not in your research later on. This number three, you, we can define a dynamical system that says, let me take any number on unit intervals. So here is a unit interval. starting with zero and going to one. So any number in between. And at end stage of by looking at this number, because this will be now a map forward in time, I get that number, but three times in size. And if I try to plot it, 
you know, it'll look like this. There will be a unit box, then there will be a repeat of the unit box. There will be third copy of the unit box. And what this map is, it's just a linear map, this slope three. So at this point, its value will be three. So this very crude map just stretches everything by the stretching factor called three. Now that's a very boring process because you know any time small interval I start with, I would just eventually get something infinite to look at, and that's not very nice. What I will construct is, you know, I first told you by hand how counter constructed a counter set. And then I'll show you it is dynamical system, his rule of kind we already discussed. You know, the simplest dynamical system we discussed was Bernoulli map. So I'll show you how it's related to that dynamical system. We want to confine the system that starts in a unit interval. Uh, we would like to keep it there. You know, we want to confine this to something that could be zero because origin is obviously a fixed point. And I'll introduce new name for this because it's slightly different problem. So the phi at time n, at, for any n, uh, has to be strictly smaller than one but uh, equal or larger than zero. That we do by taking modulo of result here. And the result is now a map that takes unit interval, stretches the neighborhood of the fixed point until this one third of the interval gets stretched to entire interval, then once you get out of there, you take a modulo one of the numbers. So you look at the remainder. Uh, that's what modular operation does. And that moves this piece of the map down here. And that makes it a nonlinear problem because this operation cannot be described by any linear you know, rule. It's, uh, so now we are in a world of nonlinearity where I stretch except at the breaking points in which I have to do this extra thing of shifting the map a little bit. So this is uh, what we call Bernoulli map where I have three possible outcomes. At every step, I have something that's either between zero and one third or between one third and two thirds or between two thirds and one, right? Because I'm dividing into all this thing. So now let's uh, do the following. So let's give name everybody who lands here, we assign a letter. It's a, you know, I'm writing a number, but I think of it as an address, as a letter. An address, not something that's uh, being manipulated by this map, but it describes where you land up. And, you know, I have three outcomes and I'll call it zero, one, two. So I'll have an alphabet which takes value zero, one, two. And that turns out to be just representing number phi in base three. Not binary, but ternary base. So, you know, phi at time n, and I'll drop this, you know, I would have to put it also on the other side, but uh, is either in the first interval, so it's uh, in that case m would be zero, and we have to put it all the way to the left, but actually it's not all to the left. So I just subdivide the interval in three parts and check which part he is in, and that's done by this. Uh, m equals two plus. And now the compact writing this way, I don't know where we got this from, or from uh, 
Italians and Renaissance. But what we do is we just keep this integers m1 as a sequence. And now any number on this line can be written as this infinite sequence in base three. So that's how you understand Bernoulli map. It just says that if I have a number that has some value in base three, then by multiply it by three, then everybody gets promoted because you know it cancels threes in here. So this shifts to the left. And I this tells me in which interval I end up. So this is actually symbolic address of where my number is. Cantor introduced a new thing that's very important for us, which I call pruning. And subversively, I've made lots of people call it pruning. If you're an urban person, you don't know what pruning is. When you have a tree and it has branches you don't like, you come with the pruning shears and you prune, you cut the branches. So what Cantor did is he cut the middle branch of this rule. So he pruned. After Cantor gets to this area, bush, field, whatever, it turns out that only two of these branches exist. They survive. The one that goes from origin to one third and the one that goes from two thirds to, uh, to one in value. And what used to be in here, suppose that there, at every point there was a cut. And if by iteration, they end up in this interval, the door is open and uh, cats run away. This one is worse than unstable because anybody who lands in it falls through the floor and disappears. So it's like having a billiard table where you know all trajectory is unstable, but then there is a hole and you lose the ball. And now the game is uh, you're trying to find out how many you know balls that you started with survive and iterations. And that's a very typical pruning situation. It's called a repeller or something. You have very complicated sets. I might show you some examples. Uh, in which you bounce around for a while and then you find a hole and you run away. What Cantor says, if this is dynamical system, I add a new law. You know, the first law was confining it so that made it nonlinear. But then Cantor says, well, you know, letter uh, one, the label, the address for this hole is inadmissible. So counter sets consist only of the intervals of size three, you know, one half, etc. And when you go, uh, you know, you'll find there are more and more holes. I just showed you a picture. We are supposed to count how many survivors are there and how much uh, of the territory they own after this process. So counter rule is really a deterministic system, the simplest one that we have studied already, which was Bernoulli map, you know, the simplest example, how is it that you can have exact mathematical law true to infinitely many digits, absolutely true, no approximation, no noise, no nothing. And the outcome is uh, for all practical purposes uh, unknown. And why is it unknown is because for all practical purposes, no experiment and no theory can have infinitely many ternary digits in it. You know, some abstract numbers can have it, but in the world of physics, you always have finite precision. Whenever you go from infinite precision to finite precision, this can happen. So even though determinism say, I know everything for all times. If the errors are growing exponentially, that means I have to specify neighborhoods with exponential accuracy and you cannot beat exponentials, it cannot be done. So that's the basic idea why dynamical systems and in 
the, in next lecture, we'll have a very important example of it, which will be a credible example, not just some funny machine like this one, where we just have to face this kind of structures. And dynamical systems, which are unstable, will have a property of generating almost always a structure that vaguely called fractal. You know, precise definition is a little hard. So now comes the next idea, which you've already seen in renormalization theory, but you know, I can make it simpler, not so fancy. I can say, if I have a fractal, I can design a distorting lens for the fractal, you know, which will enable me to see some features of it. Basic idea is very simple. You know, suppose the size of integral is one third. If you raise it to a positive power, so you take a square of this, the size is you know, one ninth, it gets smaller. So all numbers that are smaller than one raised to some power will become even smaller. And the numbers that are larger than one raised to some power will get even bigger. So if I raise them to you know, very large power, I will get distribution of results, which is, you know, zero or practically zero for everybody below one and infinity above for everybody above one. And there'll be some critical value uh, where this happens. In this case, it's just one, zero in exponent. You know, if I raise them to positive power, they uh, get smaller. If I raise them to negative power, inverses get bigger. And what mathematicians have done is they've made it into a rule how to obtain Lebesgue measure, continuous measure, even when you have these things that look very rarefied, mostly holes and very small intervals. The idea is in this picture, if I'm given a bunch of these intervals, Cantor is very idealized because they're all the same size. They're very simple. If I have the intervals which get fatter when I increase them, I will emphasize all the intervals which get fatter at the expense of the ones that don't get as fat. So I'll be blowing things up. If I raise all the intervals to power zero, then I'm just counting them. So the number of intervals, because you know, any number raised to power zero is one. And if I look at the inverse powers, the things that used to be very thin are now very important. And the things that used to be very fat are now very unimportant. So this is a lens that enables you to, from infinite set of uh, intervals, enables you to focus on the ones which are either very large or very small, or something in between, and including counting of the intervals. I won't do it here, but you will typically have two situations in these systems. If everybody is roughly the same size, then when you are looking at this thing where you're blowing them up, they're all roughly the same size, and you know they'll get all a little bit fatter, but they will all contribute. There'll be exponentially many of them. Everybody will democratically contribute to this. So physicists like to call this a gas phase. You know, I have like a gas of lots of little guys, and uh, together they uh, form this uh, state. But then I could get in a situation below some critical thing, which is called a phase transition, in which some of the intervals which used to be very thin, now raised to the inverse power, become very, very fat, and they squeeze everybody else. And you get in a situation where you really think of result of dynamical system. I gave you an example, you know, Cantor is a machine that generates a fractal set. But once you have it, you might have a situation where depending whether you're looking at lots of little guys or you're looking comparable or you're looking at few very different from the rest, you get totally different contributions to what we will call Lebesgue integral. Now what's the idea of the Lebesgue integral? You find the power, so the invention 
of Hausdorff is to have boldness to say, who says integer dimension? You know, why do I have to live in space that's one, two, three dimensional? What if I allow myself that uh, dimension is any number, not just integers? So now if you raise this uh, intervals to some intermediate power, you might be able to get to the situation where you fatten all of them in such a way that produce unit when you add them up, you know. I just showed you that uh, if I didn't do anything to them, which means I was raising them to power one, then uh, I was getting total uh, measure one. I can't take an integral on that, you know, because I want to have definition of Lebesgue integral that if I'm integrating one over unit integral, I just get one, you know. I don't want to get zero. So, but if you blow them, blow them, blow them up and evaluate your function, you know, on any one of these intervals in a way that you do Euler integrals, but now you have support of them. Can I, you know, produce an N for the size of the interval, which right now is one third, but I raise it to some power such that this thing doesn't go to zero or to infinity. So that's the idea of Hausdorff and fractal demand. Now it turns out that whenever you deal with infinities, you should be very careful because it's very easy to do lots of stupid stuff. So what Hauser says is, look at these intervals. Tuk, 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 tuk. If you don't know what I mean by intervals, counter set is a good example. I want to generalize it to things where different branches have different size. Not everybody has the same size. Dynamical systems tend to do that. They produce topologically something that looks like this, but with different sizes. So I, I will call the length of each size delta. It will be labeled in which one of these guys it ends up. We already know in this case it's some ternary number, but i is just where it lands up. And now I would like to be able to produce a measure whose sum is one, so I can integrate some function over it, like, I, you know, to compute averages on these fractal sets, for example. I have a level of resolution in this particular case, you know, first level, second level, third, you know, this is this exponent n in this particular case. So there is a level of resolution. I sum up over everybody, and now how this says, uh, why don't you raise this to power d, which we now call h for Hausdorff? So it's some number which is not an integer. It's just a real number. And that defines the total length of some of these intervals, which each of these little covers has been manipulated by being raised to the power. Now, you know, what's the tricky part? Hausdorff says these guys have to be optimal cover. Which means that in a general case, in a general case, when I don't have a linear map, but let's say parabola, you can do this with parabola, then they will all have different sizes and their sizes will depend on, you know, they can be labeled by uh, where they are, but they're different. And optimal means is don't just cover them with, you know, nickels or dimes or something, but find the smallest possible interval at level n that tightly fits what survives in the next iteration of this thing. You know, so these guys are variable. That particular thing turns out to be really hard to implement in practice for anything of interest. So that's mathematics versus real life. You know, lots of beautiful mathematics for Hausdorff, but no human can actually implement it. 
except in the trivial cases, which don't generalize. So now what you do is you take as a horizontal va value possible values of this exponent, dh, and um, there is a very special one. And you know, vertically you plot the measure s and d as a function of this dimension. And what you are morally interested in is the situation where they sum up to one, so they fill out tightly the unit interval. But when you actually look at this sum for increasing n, it gets crazier and crazier because, you know, as you increase n, every interval has gotten exponentially smaller, but exponentially more of them. So you're adding more of the things. There is a curve that you get experimentally, which looks something like that for any finite n, which is on the left of some critical value, you have shrunk the interval so much that it doesn't matter there is exponential number of them, they're too thin and they add up to zero. As n increases, they're getting closer to the zero and on the left hand side, on the right, this side, they go off to infinity. Hauser dimension is defined as the limit of this. So you have optimal covers. In one example, we'll work out next week, we can actually write optimal covers, but it's almost always impossible to do because this now, you know, in one dimension that I'm drawing for you, you're covering things with little one dimensional intervals. When you're looking at two dimensional uh, maps, that then you have to cover them. D is an area. In three dimension, it's a three dimensional volume. And you know, you have to add all the edges of the stupid volume in such a way that they're optimal. I have a as question. As far as I know, no human can do this. Is the curve plotted in the limit of infinite? The curve is plotted for the finite n, this blue curve. It's approaching its limit. And the limit is a very crazy function for n equals infinity. On the left hand side, it's zero every place. On the right hand side is infinity, and you know it jumps in this limit from being zero to being infinity. But it's a very awkward limit. If you're a mathematician and Hauser was a great one, you say this is it. Uh, I've proven it. I go home. If you're in a laboratory of Professor Flavio Fenton, there's no way you can do this. <laughs> so, so the idea is very seductive. It's cheap, it's easy to explain. I told you everything you need to know. That there is a number which is not necessarily zero and one. We still have to show how it works in specific example. What dimension means is that when I was doing integrals in let's say three dimensions, the way I think of what I call dx1, dx2, dx3, and the little cube volume in the Lebesgue integral, you know, integral over dx, is I have a little hypercube, which in this case is just cubed three dimensional, but in general it's more dimensional. And I've divided my space into this little hypercube. So I can do this on computer. And whenever I integrate, I just look at the value of function in the center of each of these faces. And I discretize my calculation as a sum over the small intervals. And this generalizes that in the case where many boxes are empty. Now, one way to think of this as a dimension is to work out simple examples with boxes. So here is a case where it agrees with our intuition. So suppose we have a plane and we are trying to integrate over unit square. And one way to do this is we divide it in four little pieces. So the number of pieces, the number of, you know, now not intervals, but areas is four. 
and each one is of scale which is one over r because we are divided by two. So you know, so this is called scale factor. We have to divide by r to get the length of the side, and this is called the uh, you know number of pieces. And then we keep doing this. So if we divide the unit interval into three pieces, our scale is r equals three. But number of the pieces that we have, boom, 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 is nine. And you get the drift of it, you find out that the M, the number of the pieces, equals my scale factor R to the minus dimension, which in this case dimension is three. No, I'm sorry, it's two. I'm in a plane. This is obvious, right? Because uh, the scale is linear on the edge. Now uh, I can produce the formula from this law for dimension. Suppose I didn't know what the dimension was. I was just blind and I was just counting these boxes of different size. And dimension says I take logarithm of both sides. logarithm logarithm and this is you know uh, this minus I put it down here and the dimension is uh, ratio of the two logarithms so the logarithm of the number will be called topological entropy and logarithm of the scale which you know in dynamical systems is called Lyapunov exponent or something, roughly speaking. So you know I can check this. So for example, according to this formula, you know, logarithm of R to the two divided by logarithm of R is two. So that agrees with our intuition. Now you can do the same thing for hypercubes and you'll get three. So that's one way of thinking of a dimension. And similarity where it comes in is that you cover your space by similar objects as we started with, but just with scale. So they're similar up to scale, you know. So little pieces are squares, big pieces are square. And they're similar up by a scaling factor. And now what Cantor did, he generalized this. You know, that's why he called his thing dimension. He just took this form over the road there and said that's a dimension, even for my set, which is a Cantor set. So he took log m log r. This is now defined to be the dimension. Let's say house of dimension or some fractal dimension. It gets very fuzzy in practice because there are many similar objects that are called dimensions. And I hope you'll never have to compute a single one of them, but I'm duty bound to describe them. So when you look at the counter set, the scaling factor was three. So we have here uh, the scale at nth level is three to the n, but the number of survivors was two to the n. And the logarithm of two divided in a logarithm of two to the n is n times logarithm two, logarithm three to the n is n times two. So you get that the answer is logarithm of two, logarithm of three, 
which is some weird number because we're dealing with logarithms, you know, we just compute it. It's 0.63. So it turns out by that definition of dimension, this counter set is bigger than a world of points which have dimension zero, so this would be zero, but smaller than the world of lines, it should have dimension one. This is smaller than one. Now, why did Hausdorff uh, mess this up with the sums? In more general case, you almost never are in the situation that everybody is exactly one third. That happens once in your lifetime. It's a plus. My error, my error, as always, the number of boxes and uh, their size uh, kind of inverse to each other. And uh, the dimension comes in is that when you look at uh, two dimensions or three dimensions, you know, R is a linear scale of the edge, but you're counting volumes, areas and volumes. And that's why dimension shows up here. So that's the intuitive notion why this is a good dimension. But when you have different size boxes, you have to do what Hausdorff did, which is you have to, you know, they're not, they don't have a simple relation, you know, different, the different sizes of boxes. So Hausdorff works, he says, you know, I have a counter set and I put smallest possible boxes on pieces of it making sure that everybody within the box is, every piece of the remainder of this limit is within one of those boxes. And then you keep improving it. So it's easy, well, it's possible to describe in words and you know, it's a little painful to do it precisely mathematically, but we can do it anyhow. Nobody can actually implement how the dimensions. So what do people do in practice? So they have this intuition about dimensions of the space. Suppose that you had something inside of your, you know, 17 dimensional space or something, which is just the line. We do this all the time because our trajectories are lines uh, in, always one dimension lines, doesn't matter where I'm looking at one, two, three dimensions, there's still just one dimensional lines. So what you could do is, you know, you could have a little uh, discretization of the space. So for example, if you have two dimensions, you can say, okay, my computer only can look at things within boxes of certain size. And now what I do is, whenever a box includes uh, includes a piece of my set of interest, in this case to motivate it, just a continuous line, you know, I color it. This is turned out to be more boring than I want it to be. But, you know, I color it. And then I say, I've covered this object by number of boxes. Uh, how many boxes depend on epsilon, which is the linear size of the box? So it's a function of epsilon. And intuitively, this corresponds to this linear object you know, being approximated by little steps here. And their number is how many I can put within epsilon. So you can now define dimension to be logarithm of this number of boxes divided by the size of each box. And take the limit. Now, here is a thing that you're not able to do, really, unless you're, but you know, you can do it numerically to some accuracy. Make this box to smaller and smaller. And, you know, you can see that I have 
lots of boxes in any dimension, but only those who actually in one of their dimensions, linear dimensions, sit and envelop the object of interest will contribute and they will add up to the length, you know, length. And uh, each little step is a size epsilon. So that's a number of boxes if I was looking continuously. Now, suppose I was looking at something that was area in any dimensions. So suppose I was looking at something that look at some area. And I would find out that if I count how many boxes cover that area as a function of epsilon, it would be the area divided in little squares of size e square. And if I take this limit, you know, here I would find that this is going to dimension equals one. And this is going to the dimension equals two by this definition. So that's, you know, a variant of the house of thing, but the difference of box dimension is that you don't have to think. So it's designed for engineers and non mathematicians. It says, I stick this thing on my computer. If it's a big, bigger computer, I can put, you know, more little volumes. And I get a number and I publish it in physical review letters or some other cheap uh, press. The reason why I'm being grumpy about this, I'm duty bound to explain it to you because you'll see pictures. That's especially true in the 80s and 90s, you know, the cover magazines and when they used to be magazines and just web pages, you know. There were lots of pretty pictures of fractals. I had friends who created the fractal art, you know, it was like using new kind of brush and so on. And, you know, anybody in high school could do this. You only needed a Commodore or something. So it's very accessible, very cheap. Uh, this uh, advent of computer games. And, and it turned out to be useful, for example, uh, a colleague who was a Georgia Tech mathematician, but not anymore, you know, created a company called Fractals, which was a way to encode uh, photography pictures. And today it's actually part of JPEG algorithms. So when you look at your picture, parts of the picture, fine structure picture, sometimes it's created by this kind of fractal uh, repetition so you can code it as a simple rule rather than remember all the pixels it's very seductive you know you can hum it everybody can do it after a while you find it very ugly you know and when i see another fractal piece of art uh, i say this is a fractal you know this is not art <laughs> this is nothing it's aesthetic objection but that doesn't really matter but there is a more profound objection i told you that the way the Cantor set is constructed is not that I'm giving infinite specification of all the intervals. I'm just taught the rule. Now, rule can be stated in one or two lines. So it's like Newton laws, which you can write in few symbols. But because it's linear and modular, this and that, it's very simple to implement, you know, either by thinking or by on computers. The problem is all this fractal thing is that they look at the result of applying this rule and forgetting that there was a rule that created it. So you're just looking at snapshots, but you're not, you know, finding out how do, did you make them. That's profoundly stupid. You know much more about a system. Why are you not using that information? You know, dynamics is so rich. Why throw it away? Now, they throw it away because, you know, they wrote silly computer programs, produce some numbers that are like this number. You know, I showed you that counter set was, you know, 
0.0639. Now, in that particular case, you can write 17 digits to it. But whenever you have to take logarithms of your data, you know, you're throwing all the information away because taking a logarithm of any numbers produces smaller, much smaller number. And taking ratio, what's called log log plots, results in something that's just uh, an embarrassment. You know, you're using so little of what you actually know. So it's being intellectually lazy. That's number one. Number two, it's useless. If your professor who hasn't done any calculations herself or himself, but you know, exploits graduate students to do the real work. If your professor wants you to produce fractal dimension of uh, frog heart or whatever, push back, tell them why. And you know, there's a very notorious example from the beginning of the subject. When people got used to using little uh, Commodores and small computers, looking at pictures and you know, doing this kind of very simple calculations, they looked at things that looked fractal to them. Turbulence is obviously one of the pictures that looks like that, but they looked at climate. And climate, you know, we care about it more and more every day. Even then, you know, we already knew that things were going down south. And they ran this algorithm, box dimension, on the best data that they had on climate, which was millions of dimensions, because we all did then, you know, our planet is the best measured experimental system ever. You know, we have amazing amount of data about everything about our planet. And no matter what they did, they found that climate is seven dimensional. Which, if you're lazy, is a great news because, you know, it means that hidden in this million, some billions of numbers, there is something that's only seven dimensional. And, you know, that's almost within reach of humans. One, two, three, we understand. Four, we can kind of compute. And seven seems pretty useful. And my colleague, David Ruel, what's called mathematical physicist, is a person who understands mathematics but does care about physics was so desperate about this nonsense, he wrote a very simple paper explaining that everything that's more than seven dimensions looks like seven dimensions. And the problem is, you know, so elementary, it's embarrassing. If you have a, you know, a cube and there is some set of points within, within it, I gave you examples when they're connected like lines, but usually they're like countersets. They're not. Then what you have to do according to these prescriptions, you have to produce little boxes in three dimensions whose size is, you know, epsilon times epsilon times epsilon. In this case, they're little hypercubes. And their number, number of such boxes, uh, is epsilon cube. This is small number, so look at the inverse. So that's you know a huge number. And few of them, very few of them, have something in them. So if you're running this on computer, you're mostly looking at billions of empty boxes when you go higher dimensions. And very, very rarely you find a box that has something in it. So that's what this kind of housed of, you know, perfectly good mathematics, house of definitions do. There are lots and lots of boxes. Most of them are empty. You only keep the ones that are alive. And in this case, you know, a tight fit to what remains, but that's second order effect. It's cheap music, it's possible to explain, it's very seductive, you can publish pictures, you can do this in you know, undergraduate courses, you can explain it to the high school students. And it's just useless because there are no computers. Again, at the same situation, you cannot beat exponentials.
So if I'm living in billion dimensions, there is no way I can construct billion dimensional little boxes, <laughs> you know, cover a few things that exist. And when you make reasonable estimates, you know, what's the resolution that you have, you find out that there is a limit that's roughly speaking seven and the climate is not seven dimensional. So that's a bad thing. Now people try to fix it. So here is a fix, which almost looks like physics and sounds good. And it was done by my friend, Peter Grasberger, who was Austrian, but didn't behave like a good Austrian or German. So they were, they were never, even though he became very famous for his work, you know, the Germans and Austrians would never give him a real job because, you know, the guy doesn't wear a suit. Uh, but he did amazing work and eventually, you know, got gainful employment. And he and uh, another friend called Prokacha did very careful fix. And the careful fix was this. They said, look, uh, let's not fill the box like, you know, idiots just fish around until something uh, pops up. Let's be uh, selective. So let's actually look at our data. For my data point, I'll take little volumes, for example, little spheres. Uh, it could be hypercubic box, that's a technical detail, it doesn't really matter. And what I can do is uh, I can measure for every little box, how many neighbors, how many other data points, if I've collected millions of them, how many of them sit uh, within one particular neighborhood. Took, 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 some number here, some number here. And we take boxes of the same size, but uh, in different neighborhoods. And it turns out, you know, they all, roughly speaking, behave the, like the radius of the box to some dimension. You can write them that way as uh, you know, logarithm of. Uh, but that local dimension, you know, local density, how many neighbors you have depended on where you are. So, you know, this is neighborhood X and, you know, this is neighborhood Y or whatever. In, uh, but there are points in your state space. And then you say, you know, let's average over it. And, uh, that's, uh, you know, you sum them up, you take the logarithm, you divide it by n, and you get an estimate for the whole set that says the average dimension works like e to the sum exponent. And then if you are as amazingly competent as Peter Grasberger, you can take for example, Lorentz attractor. Now, you know, most of us are not as competent as Grasberger, so we couldn't do it. Certainly, Prokacha or I couldn't do it. And you do this for the thing that we explained already, Lorentz, which looked like it was one dimensional in Poincare section, but when you look closely, it had a structure that we now call fractal structure. And then on this side, you take a logarithm of epsilon, so log of epsilon. Now you take logarithm on both sides, so here you have to have logarithm of this so-called correlation dimension. You can interpret it as because you're looking at how many neighbors you have, how correlated are with your neighbors. And, you know, you run Lorentz forever, you change the neighborhood size, and you find how many guys live in this neighborhood. And you do this on logarithmic scale, exponentials become linearly spaced. So you do, do this for, you know, scales, uh, 
you know, one, one tenth, one thousandth, one hundredth, one thousandth, etc. So here you do it for smaller and smaller things. You count, you know, how many neighbor would you get? And, you know, you're looking at very small numbers here. And then if you are Grasberger, that's reproduced in Strogatz. You actually get something that looks like it's on a line. And, you know, this ratio, this log of this over uh, log of epsilon is the dimension, so it's a slope. And with this he heroic work, you find out the dimension of Lorentz attractor is 2.05 plus minus zero one. So, so with really heroic work, you get 1% accuracy on dimension. And it's a right ballpark because it says, when you look at Lorentz, it looks two dimensional. It's embedded in three dimensions, it looks like some kind of surface. And it turns out it's actually a little bit more than two dimensional, you know, but it's far from being three dimensional. So this is 2.05. Now, in any other problem, you know, Grasberger lives some peaceful life in, I don't know, Alberta, Canada at the moment, or someplace I lost track. And you don't have Grasberger, and you will not be able to produce this log, log plot. If you do it, and, you know, some other colleagues and friends of mine, were barely graduate students, but decided to find out, you know, what's this nonsense about fractals? Are they really that useful? So they looked like at 800 papers that declared their measured fractal dimension. It turns out for everybody else except Grasberger, uh, this curve looks something like that. So if you're not Grasberger, you're a graduate student at Georgia Tech, not Peter Grasberger, you will get a curve, which if you really insist has a little flat stretch, typically uh, you change the scale by factor of 10. <laughs> so it's one order of magnitude and fractals are supposed to be something that describes all orders of magnitude. And you put some line here and you say that's a fractal dimension. So it's disreputable. But because it's cheap and easy and, uh, you know, people who publish this paper referee other people who publish such papers, there is lots of nonsense. Fortunately, it's died out. You know, it was like a bunch of barbarians came into your room shouting loudly. And then they, you know, run off and they do something. So they all went to solve the problem of life. So we are safe from them. Now, there is another fix, which actually is better. You know, in this fix, you run Lorentz, you get lots of points on it, then you forget that you are running a Lorentz and you start sticking a little box on the fourth snapshot of Lorentz. This is like trying to do uh, uh, recognition of letters, handwritten letters, by forgetting that a human wrote them in real time. So, you know, any good recognition problem of handwriting, you train it because it doesn't learn what the letter is, but it learns what the time sequence of your motion is to write a letter, you know, dynamical information. Then you can identify. So these guys, they just throw it away. Now, the other thing uh, actually makes more sense and it's more in the spirit of what can be done. The other thing says, well, when I look at these fractal structures, I see that, you know, if my glasses are not particularly good, I see someplace in the middle of my space, something that has three kinks on it. But now if I get better glasses or, you know, another graduate student or better grant or whatever, and I look at this detail, I discover, what do you know? Uh, 
this thing actually is three little kings. And this one is three little kings, let's say. And this one is maybe two little kings, just to make it harder. So it has more structure. Now, this is generated by some law of nature, like Bernoulli map uh, modified to be a counter map. And uh, so there's a deterministic, there is nothing random about this. I gave you an example. Uh, if you understood counter map, you knew everything. And you know, counter map is actually just a single application of the rule. But uh, once you have it from it, you can extract what happens when you apply the rule infinitely many times. And that's in the next course. I will not teach it here. So, so this is not so bad. Uh, you know, you can do that. And if you do it in this self-similar way, saying that, you know, I apply same rule over and over, uh, you're doing what nature does. But it still drives me crazy because why? You know, life is short. Why would you do this? Please explain why you're doing this. <laughs> why? Because if you're a physicist, you have to tell me, you know, what thermometer do you use? So you look at a cloud, you stick a thermometer in it because you're a person who measures what happens in nature, and you get a number out. Is this number housed of dimension? Any of the dimensions? No. You know, all this stuff is uh, very incestuous. You have a computer, you know, it generates Lorentz equation. I have a computer. It takes Lorentz equation and generates a number, one number out of infinite information about a system. And they talk to each other, looking at infinite details, which you just average off and throw away. And there is no physical measurement in any of this. So my advice is you'd have to know what house the dimension is and what these fractals are because you can avoid it. It's a cheap idea that everybody understands. But when you start working, you have to ask yourself, am I describing a phenomenon that I can measure and I can test? And with schmachtels, I've never seen an example of it. Next time, I'll give you some useful knowledge <laughs> rather than try to rage, rage against the dying of the light. You know, the crazy thing about all this is that it was known 20 years before physicists started publishing the stupid paper, how to do it right. So it was just embarrassing. Instead of going to school, learning how you do it right, because, you know, mathematical physicists did it correctly, they just published all this crap, which we all forget.